How does an inquiry coach support safety? What would I do as an inquiry coach in that situation? The, the, there's, there's, there's a few layers that you want to understand as, as how I'm thinking about what the response is. So I don't want to just respond right away. I want to actually show you the, the thinking that I'm doing about it. In general, um, when people are in an inquiry EGP session, they have some curiosity. Otherwise, they wouldn't have come to the meeting at all. But they might not feel safe expressing the curiosity. So there's two different things. There's what is the actual level of curiosity that they have? Um, actually, maybe three things. What is the level of curiosity that they probably need to have or should have in order to be uh, rightly engaged with whatever question they asked? Like, you know, the person's basically saying, hey, what course curriculum should I choose? or what actions should I take over the next year? Help me to, to make a good choice about this. That's a pretty profound question and it's important. But what's, what's wanting to happen though is, is that they're wanting to expand that question into questions that are relevant for them, that they would relate to, but they might not have the skill to do that. And therefore they might not, as you said, have adequate curiosity. So there's a curiosity level, then there is the necessary level of curiosity, right? Some threshold that needs to be passed. And then there is the degree to which they feel safe expressing curiosity. So one of the things that's important as part of any group facilitation process is helping people to create safety for one another. And this connects back to the emotional maturity thing, which is why we went into all of this based on uh, a person's remark on, hey, I was thinking about emotional maturity. And I said, that's a great lead in. So here's the tail end of that. This is the other end of that call. So the point is, is that to create emotional safety, I want to create a degree of emotional awareness on the part of the people in the group. I want the people in the group to, in a sense, be manifesting emotional maturity, i.e. a degree of wisdom. So that means essentially that I need to have at least an implicit agreement field. As an inquiry coach, I'm also a facilitator. As a facilitator, what I'm basically doing is I'm saying, hey, I need everybody in the conversation to leave space for other people to, to have curiosity and to express that curiosity in the form of questions. And if anybody's judging someone else's questions, and a judgment, by the way, is a statement or an injunction. Usually it's a statement. I might say that wasn't a question. As a facilitator, I might just make the observation. Hey, the agreement is we're doing EGP. This meeting is around questions. If you can't do that, then just sit tight or go ahead, join another meeting where you can be part of a conversation, right? The agreement is that we are in a process to explore the questions that matter. And therefore we wanna create enough space for people to feel safe expressing those questions and that they won't be um, chastised or judged or that they will have to face some implications later. So for instance, there's a, there's a degree of anonymity that is needed in a group, right? When I'm, when I'm processing, and this goes back to the logistics of how you hold EGP process itself, but we really want the group, the content of the group to stay the content of the group, except for the questions. The questions is the only thing that actually goes out. The statements, the opinions, who said what, who had which ideas, who asked which questions, that's completely not recorded. And we wanna make sure that there is essentially a degree of indemnification that, you know, say there's a community that's working out something about tobacco and whether that's healthy or not. You know, some scientist may pop the question and say, hey, you know, looks like the evidence is causational, not correlational. Are they basically shining us? And, you know, that question needs to be asked, right? 
but the person that's doing the asking for sure as heck doesn't want the lobbyists of the corporation to know that they face that question. So there's a sense here of I would want to be anonymous and not have that associated with my person. I need to give the same gift to everybody in the room. And I need to be sure that if one person is denying that to another, that I basically in the process itself as the moderator, as the facilitator say, that's not okay. What is okay is curiosity. And there is a sense of a need to help people to feel safe, to have curiosity, and therefore to basically notice when people are making questions or making statements. Because statements don't feel safe. Injunctions feel even less safe. Questions feel safe, but only if there's no repercussions for asking it. So to go back to the question that you were asking, because I noticed I'm answering a question and that was the point. If a person has a low level of curiosity that is insufficient to the degree of curiosity that they need to have, the best that you can do is to encourage them to do that by making the environment safe. And then probing a little bit by asking questions that if you were in their shoes, you might notice yourself asking that are just one step away from what they did ask. So, you know, I might go to really advanced things. And in fact, in this whole example of, you know, inquiry coaching with all the digressions and so, so forth. And of course, you have to subtract the digressions to see the example. But the point is, is that I've taken a lot of places where I've gone far. I've basically taken a question and I've I've translated into steps that are pretty far removed, but I, I, I'm tracking that the person that is hearing my phrasing of those questions, that they're still proximate enough to what their need feeling was, that they would recognize the question. Now, we know that because they would assent, they would say, oh, yes, that feels like it. In fact, that feels really good. I'm glad that you did that. I got that feedback a few times. So. In a sense, what I'm looking at is to ask a question is kind of at the limit of what is their next step. The question that they would have asked if they had felt fully alive, fully endeavored, as wise as they could be. So in effect, there's a, like, you know, if I go too far, they'll say, I don't recognize what you just said. If you go not far enough, they're not going to find it interesting. So in effect, if a person has a low level of curiosity, you, you might not be able to go very far in terms of what your curiosities would be in their place that they can recognize, oh, I could be curious about that. You might not get to the point of an adequate level of curiosity to for them to move forward effectively in life. This goes back to the skill thing. In some places, you, you just can't have a person understand things that, that that's just not there for them, right? They They may need to experience things in their lives in a way that that is is to some extent skill building for them or maybe not you know i there's only so much i can really do and so in effect there's a sense of i can help them by creating examples of questions that would be kind of the next available questions for them and i can hope that they they pull that in enough that they that they feel enough safety to explore the range of questions that they would need to to adequately respond to their life challenge as an inquiry coach, I'm going to do that as best as I can. But now I'm going to have to, as a moderator, balance that with the needs of the group, because there may be several people in the group that are way more advanced. And therefore, I'm going to have to sort of choose the, the degree to which I'm helping this person to the degree to which I'm helping these other people as well. And that's a very subtle balance. As a facilitator, um, you know, you can only really do your best. I, I try to do my best. And, and as a result, I'm, 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 I'm trying to basically help each person at every skill level become more skillful, but you're, you're never going to have a group where everybody's at the same level. So you're, you're choosing one-on-one -on -one conversations in the beginning to help people to, 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 to get engaged. And if you can, if you find that person early, um, one of the things I didn't do in this call, uh, again, because it's a, um, it's a zoom call and not in person, but if it's in person, I'm actually spending like while I'm in the one-on-one -on -one engagement, I'm actually looking to see who's the least engaged in the room. And then I'm going to try to engage that person next. So in effect, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find the person that has the, the need for the most didactic process, who has the least skills. Because 
that will make it safer for the people that have the most skills to bring out their skills. It's also going to make it easier for them to see how I work with this process. In effect, they're going to learn better inquiry coach skills because they are, in effect, um, able to see how it's working in the case where I actually need to encourage curiosity. So in that sense, as an inquiry coach, usually when I'm in person, I try to work with the most intractable person. But in this particular case, you'll notice I didn't do that at all. I just took whoever was feeling the most moved. Um, in person, you'll have a better sense as to how to navigate the relationship between getting things going and ways of making it safe for people and ways of teaching the technique as you're demonstrating it. Um, this particular session has had a lot of emphasis on inquiry coach training. And part of that is because it's getting to the point where we actually need people to understand this stuff well. And everybody on this call has been studying this work directly or indirectly for a while. Now we're starting to get into the practice of it.